We're we're recording. <laughs> Again, saying this problem that your speaker is not working properly. Um, can well, you start the recording too? Uh, sure. I, I think it is actually recording. No, but, it is. Um, it is recording. I literally heard it. It said I'm recording. It said got it. Yeah, everything. We're recording. Doing fine. No, Do you think it, there's a problem says, with the audio? I, this is the same thing that happened last time. Why don't you just start, do a recording on your end too, and then if if you know, just in case, okay? Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, I think we're ready. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Cynthia, and I run this webinar series for North San Joaquin uh, Valley CNTS. Our speaker is also named Cynthia, but so don't get us confused. <laughs> and uh, welcome to uh, our 13th webinar where we cover you know exciting topics in uh, California native plants. So I'll tell you more about our speaker in a bit. Um, but the topic is arranging California native plants and bouquets, garlands and wreaths for the holidays. Oh and uh, Michael will probably repeat this but uh, if you have questions just put them in the chat and we will um, ask the other Cynthia, all the you know, we'll get to the other, get to your questions when she finishes, and then we'll ask her all the questions that you raise. Unless it's something extremely time dependent, in which case Mike will bring it to our attention. So I'm going to just give you a quick overview about our webinar series, and then Mike, Mike and I are both on the board of our little chapter. We have a big area, but we're not a very large uh, group yet. We're the North San Joaquin Valley. The center is kind of Modesto, uh, um, Merced, places like that. Uh, then Mike's gonna talk about our chapter and CMPS in general. I'll introduce you to our speaker. And then just so you all know, we record all the sessions and upload to our YouTube channel. So, we have already now 12 videos recorded and placed on our YouTube channel. And our Facebook page and our, our website actually too has, announces the new webinars. But I'm gonna um, give you a, a, a view of what we're gonna be doing after, after this one in a moment. Um, just to tell you the kind of past things, because these are all, all all in the YouTube, so you can go look at them if you want. I just want to tell you what they are. There was a uh, picked off with biodiversity in the native plant gardener by Arvind Kumar. Some of you may know him. He's been a very avid native plant gardener for many years. He's a longtime friend of mine, and he's in the Santa Clara Valley chapter. Um, then in September, we had reliable California native plants for garden with no irrigation. By Christoph Kosminski. This uh, this is very relevant to us because uh, even though he's in San Jose, his garden is is uh, in the very hot part of San Jose. He has an acre, and uh, so he that was very popular. And he's going to come back soon and do part two of that. Um, no, let's see. Then we had planning and growing a native plant garden with Carl Hill, who's the founder and owner of Blossom Hill Natives here in in uh, Oakdale. Uh, next was inspirational outings, some of the public lands you can go to that have been sort of recreating the original uh, flora and fauna. We had a, a botany one by a local professor at uh, San Jose State. And we had Cynthia, the other Cynthia, we had her also talk first about arranging native plants and bouquets, garlands and wreaths, but that was a focus on, not on the holidays, just on generally doing that. So now she's here to talk about doing holiday things in particular. Uh, we had vernal pools. We uh, had the person that really envisioned and created the La Loma California Native Plant Garden here in Modesto. Um, another gardening talk, landscape design with native plants. Uh, then we had uh, one of the, 
founders of the Bryophyte chapter of CMPS, talk about Bryophyte basics. Um, then Native Plants of the San Luis National Wild Refuge and Wildlife Benefits from one of the uh, rangers there. And then another one that's, you know, native plants plus something else, which was native plants and our native fish. And that was also by one of the park rangers. So today we're going to be talking about arranging California native plants and bouquets, garlands and wreaths for the holidays. Our speaker is Cynthia Jean Dritch. And uh, then in, in January, we skipped December, but in January, Mike, who's on the call, is going to be really giving us a really good look at uh, Cowscape, uh, which is an incredible tool for all of us, particularly for gardeners. And then after that, in February, we have California water culture, an overview of how California's unique waterways have been transforming how it happened and what it means. I don't know how she's going to get this an hour and a half, but um, so everything's being recorded. So if you can't make it, you can always go look at it there. This is our, our, our channel. We're starting to build up a nice audience. Um, and so just a quick summary. Again, everything's being recorded. It's, I says typically, but it's always the second Monday evening of each month. We know we don't do one when it's in December. The next one is Monday, January 8th. Um, and this is my email address. And if you have an idea for a webinar that uh, you know someone that could give that webinar and just want to know more about it, just send me an email and I'll look into it. If you'd like to be a speaker, that's even better. And actually, for we even though we're a small chapter, we've been able to pull quite a few of our chapter members and, and the chapter I belonged to before to give to give these talks. So we have a wealth of knowledge within our, our own group. Okay, now I'm going to pass this to Mike, who's going to give you an overview of our chapter. Mike? Yep, here I am. And let me see if I can steal your screen from you. You should be able to. All right, you seen that? Okay, no. um, you see it now? It, no. You're not seeing it. It it says it's sharing. I uh, see it nicely. Okay. Um, Cynthia, you're still not able to see it? Um, Cynthia, you have to stop sharing your screen. I... I it's uh somebody else said that they could see it and uh I oh can... wait a minute i got confused I it's, yeah i don't know um, <laughs> okay let's just assume that everybody can, can see can it can everybody see his screen but me yeah yeah i right i okay i i put some stuff something in the chat um what i put in was some uh some information i want to be talking about so let me first talk uh talk about uh what i'm doing here I wanted to give you an introduction to our chapter the north san joaquin valley chapter of the california native plant society California Native Plant Society is a statewide organization, and you can join it for a regular individual membership of $50 to receive Flora and Artemisia magazines, get benefits such as discounts at certain nurseries, sales and such, and the ability to join two different chapters of CNPS. If you'd like to join North San Joaquin Valley chapter or and one other, such as the Santa Clara Valley chapter, the Sacramento chapter, or others, that will be an option when you go to the link on the slide. On the slide, uh, so we hope that you join us here in the North San Joaquin Valley chapter and whichever other chapter you feel kinship with. I said the membership was fifty dollars, but there is an option to choose other price options and higher membership levels for above for that are available for those of you who are able to help this worthy organization more financially. It is a great cause. And the regular membership link is right there, cnps.org slash membership. Remember, this is the link to join up. I should point out that long that long bar, let's see. Oh, no, that was right. That long bar, see over here on the right. That long bar along the bottom uh, is uh, labeled other, is for those who want to choose another amount, so other than $50. And notice the bottom of that barrel is actually $25. So not everybody can afford $50, but we have removed uh, membership level titles, and that includes the low income level. So 
If you want to join for $25, if you feel that that's what you need to do because you can't afford higher with the magazines and all, but you just can't afford a $50 membership, we still want you to have the opportunity to join us. Just fill in that amount, the minimum of $25 and you're in, or you can do any other amount you feel good about. So um, the sixth edition of our newsletter was sent out just a few days ago. Volume six of the Oak Branch was sent out to all of our members via email. This issue looks back on the chapter's past, gives conservation news, and tells us about keystone species of plants that do not that do allow more butterfly and moth species to host than other plants. We learn about the toyon and see what plants are blooming at the La Loma Native Garden in November. And I we're thrilled to invite you to a captivating nature walk on November 18th, 2023 starting at 10 o'clock a.m. at the picturesque Knights Ferry Recreation Area. This event promises a deeper connection with the local ecosystem and offers an opportunity to learn more about our fascinating wildlife. Why you should join us? Breeding Chinook Salmon. Witness the awesome, inspiring spectacle of breeding Chinook Salmon. Learn about their incredible journey and the critical role that they play in our ecosystem. And fall foliage, immerse yourself in the vibrant colors of autumn, discover the science behind the changing leaves and how it impacts our environment. Lichens and moss, ex uh, explore the enchanting world of lichens and moss as they come to life in the cool fall air. Um, learn about the unique uh, ecological importance and woodpecker wonders. Knights Ferry is home to a variety of woodpecker species. Keep your eyes peeled um, and your binoculars ready ready to spot those remarkable birds in action. And remember that we collaborate with the Audubon, the local Audubon Society. So they'll have representatives there to tell you about all the different birds that we see. Uh, the mushroom hunt, if conditions are right, we may even stumble upon some fascinating fungi. Our guides will share some insights into the world of mushrooms and their role in the forest ecosystem. The nature walk is designed for individuals of all backgrounds and experience levels. Whether you're a seasoned nature enthusiast or just beginning to explore the outdoors, we welcome you to join us on this educational journey. Our knowledgeable guides will provide insights into the local flora and fauna, sharing sites, the stories about that connect us to the natural world. This event is perfect for families, students, and anyone eager to learn more about the wonders of their local environment. Let's come together to appreciate the beauty and significance of Knight's Ferry Natural Treasures. We look forward to sharing this memorable experience with you. And I should point out that we intend to do everything by email. We recognize that there are some people who actually prefer U.S. mail. And for those who are inconvenienced, we do apologize. But we don't yet have the financial and volunteer base to put the newsletter out that way. And CNPS has asked all of their chapters to find ways of reducing carbon and saving all that paper is one of our contributions. If this is a true problem, let us know. But so far, no one has complained. If you are on a list, you should have received our newsletter. Um, but if you somehow got missed, let me know in chat. And to be put on our list, Let me. Um, we want our newsletter to get out to everyone. That's our mission, to promote native plants around our region. The, and our best way of doing that is to keep native plants on everyone's mind through events and presentations and gardening. So you want to keep those of you who haven't joined the statewide organization in the loop so that perhaps you can join us for an event or two and to remind you that we are here. Why are why do we care about native plants? Well, we are offering we are finding out more and more each day about the true need for to restore our environment as much as we can. The man who's been trying to explain the need for native plants with the most eloquence is Doug Ptolemy, a professor from Delaware. He's written three books, um, maybe four, on the subject, all of which circle around the theme that we have been damaging the environment dramatically. But there is hope in native plants. 95% of all birds feed insects to their young. Caterpillars are an important component of that diet, and caterpillars cannot live on non-native plants with very few exceptions. Native plants are critical to the ecosystem and a backyard with no native plants, and that is a devastatingly high percentage of them, are ecological dead zones. Planting native plants in our yards helps moths, butterflies, native bees, and other pollinators 
and therefore birds, and the web goes on and on. Our cities need to not to be devoid of butterflies, moths, and native bees. For more information about this, you can watch a one-hour video that knocked me over like a brick. This was a talk uh, sponsored by our local Audubon chapters just this past January. The link is in the chat. So uh, if you have questions during Cynthia's talk, please add them to chat. We'll do all the questions at the end. And with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Cynthia, and I will be in chat um, for those with questions or comments. Okay, this is uh, the first Cynthia again. I, you can see my screen, right? Oh, um, uh, yes. Yeah, you're back. Okay, good. Yeah, it's a little confusing because there's two Cynthia's here. But the important Cynthia is Cynthia Jingrich. She's, uh, I've mentioned a little bit about her before, but she's a member of two of our, our chapters, which everybody can be as part of your membership. You can choose two chapters. And of course, you can still participate with other chapters. And both she and I are former members of the Growing Natives Garden Tour, which is one of the biggest tours, if not the biggest native plant tour, uh, California native plant tour in the state. Um, and if you type in gngt.org, you will find everything about it. Um, so uh, she's a ben is a native California native plant gardener. Um, She's a fantastic photographer, and I think you can already tell that. Uh, and she also does these floral bouquets and all kinds of really interesting um, shapes and uh, you know ways of, of using uh, native plants to you know, bring out their beauty and, and, and share them both inside and outside. And of course, she, uh, she'll talk to you about how she sources her, her uh, materials. Okay, so with that, um, Cynthia, do you want to take the uh, screen? Sure. Um, can you turn off sharing from your screen? You know, it doesn't really tell me how I can turn it off. It's, if you go up, pause it here. If you go up to the top, uh, it should actually say stop sharing. There should be a red tab up at the top. Well, did. Can it, have you put up your screen, Cynthia? You should be able to steal it from her, uh, Cynthia. Yeah, that's the thing. You could just I take could, it. I couldn't last time. It says I'm I'm sharing. Okay. Can can Mike? Can you see her screen? No, I see yours. Uh, can mm -hmm. you go up and try and? Is there a red? A red. Uh, a red tab at the top that says stop sharing. The tab of which you speak, I do not see. Okay. Um, try it again. I changed something. We've never had this problem before, so I don't know, really know what's going on here. Okay, good. I, I, they, they seem to have added a feature, which confused me. All right. Is that that's yours, right, Cynthia? This is mine. Okay, good deal. You're up. Okay, um, so can you see this in the main screen? Yeah, yeah, you're okay. you're okay. Okay, thank you, um, Cynthia and Mike, for inviting me back again after um, did my first presentation in March. And the key to being invited back, I think, is um, running too long, making a double presentation. So. This is the last um, the last half of my presentation, and uh, I have some some materials for show and tell at the end. So I'm gonna um, flip through. I think pretty quickly. Um, if you wanted, as Cynthia mentioned, um, my garden was on uh, the Growing Natives Garden Tour um, in uh, April 2022, and uh, you can find it is called Habitat Haven at gngt.org. And my um, my photos and videos there of the garden are there. It's in the Santa Cruz Mountains 
in uh, Santa Cruz County, but very close to um, to Santa Clara County. So that's why I'm a member of both chapters. Um, so Cynthia gave me a very uh, warm welcome and uh, I know she loves my stuff. I just wanna put out the caveat here that I'm an enthusiast, not an expert about California native plants. I'm a gardener, not a scientist. I'm an amateur, not a professional. Um, but I had a privilege, the privilege to um, have a, an almost one acre garden in um, the Santa Cruz Mountains. And we moved there uh, 15 years ago. Um, I knew nothing about California native plants. And um, fortunately, the previous homeowner uh, <clears throat> had uh, started a small native plant garden. And then over the last 15 years, I've expanded it and removed some in, uh, some non-native plants. And, and um, I left with some uh, non-native weeds and um, a few non-native bulbs, but I, I think that most of those bulbs are gone. So it's almost 99% uh, California natives, I think. But not all of the plants are locally native to the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, and so you'll see, I'll talk about some of the materials that I used in my wreaths um, and bouquets and garlands. Um, another caveat that I had in my last presentation is that gardening with native plants is for wildlife and arranging native plants is for people. So um, I'll be reminding all of us that that the real if there's uh, if there's only a few seeds or berries and the wildlife are clearly enjoying them uh, for food or habitat or shelter um, that we want to leave them there. This is uh, this is just when we're lucky enough to have extra extra plant material and uh, we can bring bring it indoors or arrange it outdoors. Another thing that I wanna say up front, um, even though it's hard sometimes to take only foot photos and leave only footprints, um, we all in California, we're, we're cautioned to not pick any plants, even weeds that aren't ours um, anywhere that's not outside of our own gardens. Um, I think, yeah, all of the all of the bouquets and arrangements I'm going to be showing tonight are from November or December um, in previous years, except the one on the left here. This one is from um, September. And we can tell that because in the Santa Cruz Mountains, sometimes things um, either bloom later than in the valley or, uh, or they ripen later than in the valley. But so sometimes I know that people have toy on berries starting to turn red in um, September or October, but in the mountains, they don't turn red until, um, until really December, January timeframe. And then they can stay on they can stay on the trees for quite a long time. So this is the one the arrangement on the left is just showing the green toy on berries in the front. They're green, and I typically don't um, I don't cut much toy on when the berries are still green, or when the flowers are whitey creamish colors in um, the spring. I wait till um, till they ripen up. Uh, to make sure that there's going to be a lot on the shrub before I take some from for my own use. The um, the other flowers that were blooming in September were the California fuchsia, and some there were still some California fuchsias blooming in my garden um, in November, and also in November on the right uh, you can see that there was even a poppy, little poppy in the middle still blooming. I find poppies bloom all year round. Um, and then goldenrod uh, starts starts turning starts turning yellow 
in September, October timeframe in the mountains, depending on what elevation you're at. My garden is at 2,700 feet above sea level. So again, um, it also depends on <clears throat> how much rain we've had each, um, each year when things will bloom. Um, last time I was really focusing on spring and summer bouquets. Um, and uh, I did have, I had a couple, showed a couple of these bouquets that again, they're from November. So there's not a lot blooming in November in our gardens. Um, sometimes there's a um, few Cleveland sage flowers, I think in the middle. And um, what else? Um, oh, yarrow is still blooming in my garden today. Um, some phasalia, some tansy phasalia is growing, is blooming, I mean, in my garden right now. I've seen some roadside poppies blooming right now. Um, I think that's about it. But anyway, my point uh, was for these late season bouquets is that we can still use the foliage if we have extra in our gardens. We can still use the foliage and um, and or the seed pods from uh, from our earlier bouquets. Um, so on the left, there's some madrone um, leaves here and um, Cleveland sage. Uh, this is Cleveland sage that's blooming. Um, a lot of uh, coast live oak here and um, some other sages, maybe black sage down here. And I think that's about it for the arrangement on the left. Again, that was November a few years ago. And then the one on the right here, um, it has mostly seed pods or dried. This is, um, this is our version of uh, Pearly Everlasting in the mountains. I don't know the the botanical name for it, um, but uh, we call it we call ours fragrant everlasting, and uh, some people call it cudweed. Um, but this is very very locally native to um, to the Santa Cruz Mountains, and then this is some lupin leaves from the Cobb Mountain lupin. Um, so both of these both of these arrangements. Um, are interesting in the sense that they both need water in the vases because um, they're a combination of the seed pods which don't need water and um, uh, and of the fresh the fresh foliage which do. Oh, I just want to point out in this one, I think I, I believe these ones here are deer weed. Um, and this is golden yarrow, which is um, not a true yarrow. It's not like that, the, the common yarrow that we have, but it, it's also very locally native as well. Um, so I am not afraid to mix up bouquets uh, where it's fresh foliage and dried seed pods together too, um, but I don't think I don't think that I would have done that. I think that would have felt kind of odd when I first started making bouquets and um, just making bouquets with spring and summer flowers and not really thinking about foliage only or seed pod only bouquets. So speaking of seed pod only bouquets, um, the one on the left, I believe it's um, black sage. Uh, Dara's Choice, and the one on the bottom is um, my Cleveland Sage, I don't know how to pronounce it, Pozzo or Pozo Blue. Um, I really, really love those flowers, and, um, and uh, I love the seed pods when they dry. Um, and these are uh, Mule's Ears seed pods, and um, when I bring the mule's ears, when they're yellow and flowering in June or whenever it is, um, when I bring them in the house, they wilt right away. So they're not a very good 
uh, they're not a very good flower to cut and bring in. And, and with my, my experience is that they don't last long at all. They start to wilt right away. Maybe I don't pound the stems or something that they, they need, but, um, but they dry beautifully um, like this. And then um, these are some bouquets that I just picked from my garden a couple of days ago. Um, the one on the left is um, the Cleveland Sage called Celestial Blue. You can see there's tiny, tiny little amounts of blooms on them, but as soon as I bring them inside, they're going to start, uh, the rest of their seeds have already started drying out and they're, they are in water so that the leaves don't wilt so quickly, um, but they won't last more than a, a week in water. Uh, and then I'm going to show you what they look like when they dry. And then uh, this one is just from a couple of days ago, and this is a red twig uh, dogwood. Um, it needs a lot of a lot of water, so I'm not sure that it's it is native to California, but I'm not sure that people have it in their gardens unless they have some um, natural uh, water um, or dampness in their gardens. Uh, I think it would probably need a lot of uh, irrigation, at least to establish it and maybe even to for it to continue growing. Um, and then here's a twig of buckbrush, a ceanothus, um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the yarrow that was growing, a common, it's just common yarrow. And it was growing right beside um, the, the seed pods that have already dried. So I think that what happened was um, the yarrow has been blooming for a few months now, and <clears throat> I think it, it maybe self-seeded and, and started to grow some more. I'm not sure how long it takes, but anyway, thrilled to have a little bit of color inside the house in November. Sorry about that. Um, the next two are uh, very quintessentially November arrangements, I think, because um, uh, the um, Douglas fir has its cones on and the black oaks are turning yellow in the background. We had a, we have about five black oaks in our um, in our yard and I just love the uh, the foliage of the black oaks. They're uh, fuchsia in spring for a little bit, then they turn green, and then in October and November and December they start to turn yellow. But I also love the um, the curviness, the or the organic, uh, just quirky shapes of the of the branches as well, and then. Um, the reason I think this is a quintessential November bouquet is because we've got some coyote brush just starting to uh, fluff out with its um, white fluff, and I don't know um, I don't know if this is male or female coyote brush, but um, and then this bouquet over here is a, a little a different different um, time, but probably from the same coyote brush. So it could still be male, even though it's fluffier, it's just later in the season. Um, so again, because these are probably wouldn't have to put the, the oak leaves in water, but because the coyote brush is fresh, just freshly cut, um, I do need to put them those bouquets in into water. And um, this is on the left. Um, I don't know. I haven't seen it in a lot of places growing in the Santa Clara Valley. Um, there, um, it's it's from Southern California. It's not locally mo native to the Santa Cruz Mountains. But um, there are some large shrubs of it um, in in my yard and um, also at our community center. And um, someone came through to cut cut it down for fire clearance. It was about 
eight to 10 feet tall. The shrub had been growing there for a long time. And instead of just trimming it, they cut it right to the ground. And you can't do that to tie out toy on bushes or lots of other perennial shrubs that are California natives. But um, this one was like, oh, just a haircut. And it, it's, uh, I think it grew about a foot in the following year. So um, I really like um, this foliage and um, the, the flowers here, again, it's from November, or December, the flowers aren't, aren't blooming yet, but they're getting ready to bloom. Um, and then this foliage here is Coast Redwood, Sequoia Sempervirens. And, um, I'm going to be talking about how I how I I like to put um, coast redwood and coast live oak foliage together. But the main uh, the main plant in here is a sugar bush, and then next door to it, of course, in December is toyon. Um, I just thought I'd show you that the picture quality, the photo quality is really bad on my screen. So it's probably really terrible for you, but um, this is a garland that I made for my friend's daughter's wedding um, in November, a few years ago. And um, I, it's about 25 or 30 feet long. And um, I created it in my, in my driveway. Um, and so it's kind of, it's it's all one big garland um, and it's very heavy. I'm gonna be talking about the weight of wreaths and garlands um, in a little bit. And then, um, so that's, that's a, a garland that uh, was fresh. It had, um, it only had three things in it, um, coast live oak, uh, tan oak and coast redwood. Um, and it dried beautifully. So after the wedding, it was fresh for the wedding. And then um, the bride's mother took it down a few days later and um, took it to their, their home and put it over their hearth. So it dried out for a couple of weeks or I guess a couple of months. Um, and it really held together very nicely dried. So I'm gonna be talking to you about some of the materials, the plant materials that last longer than others. And then um, I'm showing you this tree, I'm, I'm showing you this photo, not for the Toyon bouquet, but for the Christmas tree, because I made a lot, another long garland like this and I wrapped it around the Christmas tree because the Douglas fir, tree that we cut down from a tree farm um our neighbors uh we just went to our neighbors in in november and cut the tree down and it was kind of spindly it was the right height but it was kind of um kind of spindly and so i made it a garland which i wrapped around and um and made it look more full than it actually was and again, the fragrance of the, um, the coast redwood, I just love working with it. And um, it, it dried, uh, the, the tree dried and I stopped putting water um, in our trees because the lights, the LED lights don't get hot. There's no fire, there's no risk of fire da danger. So I just um, don't put water in the trees anymore. And but the garland that I had with redwood was uh, we just really filled out the fleshed out the tree, so it was less spindly. Um, this is an example of a of a centerpiece that I made. Um, it doesn't have water in it, but it does have it. It has a a long shallow dish with a uh, florist foam in the bottom, just to stick stick all the pieces in. And um, uh, because I was taking it to our friends for Christmas dinner. And so um, I created it outside. I'm gonna be talking to you about um, creating um, bouquets and all, all the arrangements I do, I do outside. Um, and 
at this time of year, they'll also last longer if, um, if you can leave them outside, which I recommend, but sometimes you want to bring your, your arrangements inside. Anyway, so this one has um, some of my favorites, um, some coast live oak, some tan oak. I really love these, the big, huge um, leaves of the tan oak, but um, I wouldn't take it down into the valley because it. Um, I don't want to spread any sudden oak death around. So I'm very careful about using tan oak leaves. And then um, some, some coast redwood again. So it's not, there's about five different things. Oh, and then the fir cones. And these cones are are all over our, our yard underneath the, the oaks and the firs. Um, there's a big, big six inch um, carpet of, of uh, dead oak leaves and, and fir cones and things like that, madrone berries and manzanita leaves. Um, so I really, this was a large one because the table seats, I think we were, there were 12 of us together. And so it's a very, it was a very long table. And um, uh, so this arrangement actually is about three or maybe three, three feet long. So then I'm going to talk a little bit about the wreaths. Um, the, the first ones here are very um, simple examples with only um, with very simple uh, forms. So this is on my my garden neighbor, my community garden neighbor, uh, Vicky. She grows grapes while I grow tomatoes, and she always every fall she creates the vines, the grape vines. So those are non-native uh, grape vines. And um, every at the end of every season, she creates these just simple um, wreaths. And then it's very easy to just stick in some, uh, this is bay laurel, and it dries very well, very easily too. So I'll just, sh I'll show you later. You can see the wire that I use. This is a floral wire with green paper around it. Very light wire, um, very light wreath form material and um it's a it's a very light wreath it doesn't get very heavy unlike the one beside it this is all a uh, sugar bush i made it i made a garland first and then i put it into a uh, wreath form and i'll show you uh show you a little bit later how i create the garlands but um this requires a heavy form. Oh, actually, I see it's a wire. It is a it's a store bought uh, wire form, and because the um, the garland was so heavy, I knew I couldn't just put it onto um, onto a, a simple wire frame. It needed to have the the stability of the the wire frame. I'll show you. I'll show you what I mean in a little bit. Right now I'm just showing you some of the finished wreaths and then I'm going to go into a little bit of more of a demo. Um, this photo, these photos are meant to show um, two different things. When you first make the wreath out of something like coyote brush, that's what mostly is here. I see a little bit of something else, maybe, um, maybe coast live oak. But the, the, um, this is simple enough and light enough to just go on this very homemade uh, wire, wire wreath. It just is a single band around it underneath. And I'll show you where how I made those and coming up. Um, but my point here is that um, Coyote Brush will continue um, to fluff out. So this is the same same wreath, or maybe not the same wreath, I'm not sure. Um, and this is a week or two later. Uh, it continues to, uh, to, to, 
to fluff out after uh, after it's been after the the branches have been cut. Um, this again, this is a simple one. It's only got two ingredients, two different kinds of plants. Uh, it's got the toyon and the um, the bay laurel there, California laurel. And um, the, these leaves, the laurel leaves dry nicer than the berries do. These leaves kind of curl up, the toyon uh, leaves kind of curl up, but um, the berries will last, um, you know, maybe for a week, but um, they, they do dry, they do start to dry as well. Um, here's one with only three ingredients, um, but um, that's kind of a kind of an odd combination because these Monterey pine needles here are uh, fresh, and I'm not sure how well they're going to dry. This was, I think, this was the first Monterey pine one I ever made. Um, and then, so I added some bay laurel leaves to it because they will dry well. And then I used the Cleveland sage seed pods because they were already dried. Um, I gave this, again, this is a very simple wreath. I gave this to a friend and, um, she not only hung it on her front door, uh, but she, when she was done with it, a few weeks later, she returned the wreath form to me so I can make her another one next year. So that was, that was nice. It's very simple. Just got some coast live oak here, which I have a lot of. So I use it a lot as a foliage base for my wreaths. And then it's got just a little bit of toy on some, um, Cleveland sage or creeping sage and some fir cones. And I gave it to her fresh, but this is kind of like halfway through where it's starting to dry up and the leaves are starting to curl up. Um, but it's still, it's still gonna, um, the berries are, are drying, but it's still gonna be okay on her front door for a little while, um, for a couple more weeks at this point. And then um, this one I made on a homemade uh, grapevine wreath. Um, my friend uh, makes them very, they're very light and very simple. She just, she just sort of braids the vines together and um, hangs them on her apple tree to dry. And then um, I created this one fresh when the, the Cleveland sage leaves were fresh. Maybe, you know what, I think these are the creeping sage, the uh, bees bliss creeping sage leaves, because I have a lot of that as well. And so this is um, after, this is a couple of weeks later when these have all dried up together and some uh, fragrant everlasting, some fir cones. Um, so again, because these were gifts to people, this one was to uh, someone who lives in Santa Clara Valley. So I was very careful not to use any tan oak um, in case it might um, might spread sudden oak death disease. Here's some. Um, here's one that looks. Um, I think th these are exactly the same ones. Uh, this wreath is what it looked like when it was fresh. And uh, here's some Attilha poppy seeds. These, the pods are large like this. And then um, the seeds are very small and um, they kind of rattle, they dry and rattle around in those pods. And they're they're really interesting to, to see, I think. And so, um, you, you guys probably in the Central Valley, you probably have a lot of Matilla poppy, poppies. They're, they, they grow so well, even though they're from Southern California, they grow so well. Um, 
in other parts of the state. And then this is fresh sugar bush, fresh um, coast redwood, and fresh bay laurel. And then this is what those things look like. The sugar bush um, has, you know, just kind of curls up, but it looks okay dried and the coyote brush um, gets really fluffy. So there's probably about two weeks between the fresh, fresh one here and the, the dried one. And then you can just, um, if you're happy with it, you can just, you can hang it for another few weeks. You can hang them into as long as you want them. And they can get rained on. They might fall apart in the rain if you have them outside, but it's fun to see how long they'll last. Um, most of my wreaths are outside because they last longer in the cold weather. Um, unless it's raining. Um, so this one, this one is hanging on the inside and then there's another one hanging on the outside of this door. So what I wanted to talk to you about is what to consider when you're looking for your, when you're collecting your um, own California native plant materials. Um, some things last longer and um, some things are heavier when they're fresh than others. So this, um, this is a wreath, oh sorry. This is a wreath, but I wanted to suggest that you could do a smaller one um, the way I have shown here. You could use it as a candle holder for, um, a centerpiece, or you could do really small ones with napkin ring for napkin rings. You don't have to, you don't have to use, if you just have a small amount of plant material, you can still um, make arrangements that, that are smaller. Um, or you could do, you could also make a larger wreath and uh, just put berries in a few places in three or four places or five places around the wreath at the bottom maybe um, if you don't have that much toy on or you want to leave the rest of it for the birds. This one here, um, a very, very simple wreath. Um, I like it because it's got my favorite uh, coast redwood and coast live oak, but um, I just stuck some uh, some black oak, sorry, I stuck some black oak leaves on it and they will dry up and eventually um, just kind of shrivel up. But um, I think that's kind of a nice autumn, uh, an autumn wreath, not, not looking very um, like a holiday. Maybe it looks kind of Thanksgiving-ish instead of Christmassy. And then um, the other thing, the reason I have this one here is because I wanted to talk to you about the weight. If you use materials that are really heavy and um, you just put them on a wire, this one actually I, th I think is on, on grapevine, but if you just use um, a heavy gauge wire, it might not be heavy enough. The wire might not be heavy enough to keep its round shape. Uh, if the weight of the materials kind of bend it, pull it down. So that's why I wanted to show you this oval wreath. Um, and also, uh, it looks perfectly fine to me. I, I'd be happy with an oval wreath too. Um, I, it's just something, I just used it here as an example to show um, that you have to consider the weight of the materials you're using unless you're using a heavier uh, grapevine wreath or heavier wire wreath. Um, here's one. Now we're getting into uh, more types of, of plants, more, more species on one wreath. Uh, so on this one, I see some chemise, um, have lots of chemise, but 
I hardly ever use it in um, in wreaths. I don't think I've done one wreath where it's just chemise. It's it's pretty straight, so it's hard to curve hard to curve it around onto the form. Um, and then there's the usual. Um, oh, here's some madrone berries. It's really hard um, to to make these guys last very long. So when they drop from the madrones um, in November and December, uh, these guys are still turning. They're turning from green to yellow to orange to a little bit rustier, a little less red than the toyons. Um, so there's, oh, there's some more madrone berries. There's a toy on, um, and I didn't have a, I don't have a snowberry, so I don't have, um, I only made one wreath once with snowberry berries. This is my front door again, another year. Um, this one is meant to show if you just, you don't have to have, you can have lots of different materials, you can mix it up. And if you use, um, oh, I know what this one is showing, it's showing things grouped in bunches a little bit more. So you don't see these, um, uh, you don't see these seed pods all around, you just see them in one location. And you just see this hummingbird sage seed pod, pod which um, uh, some of you might, it might be a little bit too, um, too brown or, or dead looking, I guess. Um, but these seed pods here, so I, I grouped them and then I, I grouped just the fir cones in one area, a few more um, seed pods and the uh, everlasting again. On um, this one, I wanted to show you what it looks like. It's pretty, um, it's probably a week old. It looked, uh, it looked a little fresher um, when it was first created, but now it's, um, it's coyote brush is blow, is, is fluffing out. And I wanted to show you this one because this, that year I started using mossy branches, um, just collected from, you know, that fall down in windstorms and rainstorms. So um, I started putting them onto the wreaths. And again, adding something like that will increase the weight of the wreath if you're using a large wreath form like this. Hey, uh, Cynthia, just letting you know, it's almost eight o'clock. Okay. Um, okay. And uh, we we end at 8.30? Oh, uh, yeah, the 8.30, but but we're going to probably want to get these questions and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, soon. definitely. Okay, thanks for the heads up, Mike. Uh, so this one, oh, I know what I want to show on this one. Um, now I'm going to try to talk really fast. Um, this is what coast redwood looks like when it starts to dry, when it dries up. So this, this wreath might have looked all, much more green when it was fresh a few weeks ago. And now the, the coast redwood is drying up, but it dries much nicer than, uh, say, um, Douglas fir or some of the other, some of the other um, conifers in our state. And then this one I call my kitchen sink wreath. You can see um, the toy on berries are all dried up. The Cleveland sage is all dried up. Um, the oak leaves, black oak leaves are starting to dry. The, gar the goldenrod is still fresh on here. Um, and again, it's my favorite coast, uh, coast redwood. Um, all these things are typical, typical of the plant materials in my yard. So, um, I think I'm gonna, I think I, I feel like I, I got these points. Um, if you don't have a lot of berries or acorns or cones or seed pods, 
uh, you can you can do arrangements with mostly foliage, and then um, some foliage dries better than than others, and some foliage lasts longer than others. I think I got the highlights there. Um, and so this is just a quick um, quick uh, announcement. If don't don't use things that have um, that are poisonous or have big thorns like this gooseberry. These uh, the Oregon grape leaves are really pointy and sharp, so you won't want to use those either. And don't use anything that's gonna like the tan oak that's gonna spread um, uh, sudden oak death. Um, And then I, I feel like I talked about um, all of these things already. So the one point I wanna make is collect more foliage than you think you need and um, experiment, have fun. They might take longer to create than bouquets do, but they might last longer too. Um, I talked about um, all of the things that I have in my, um, my yard and garden. And then um, I, found that you have some locally native plants um, like California grape, coyote brush, we talked about a lot, the coffee berry, golden bush, I don't even know what that is, uh, buckwheats, lots of buckwheats could be used in these wreaths, and the interior live oaks. So when I'm collecting, I just go out, oh, the, the, um, the, the Monterey um, pine, uh, sorry, the Monterey pine doesn't last very long. This is the tan oak. And um, in November and December, um, our manzanitas are supposed to are, are start, start blooming. There might just be a couple, um, but if you're using the foliage from the manzanita and the beautiful twigs uh, from the manzanita, um, I would just avoid bringing in, cutting off new uh, new buds. These guys will not last very long at all. They'll be falling off your wreath before you you hang it sometimes. Um, and the madrone berries, if you ac have access to them, they're a little bit oranger than the toyon berries. Um, again, this encelia has some nice seed pods. I haven't worked with it before. So it's it's um, very simple, uh, just a few supplies, uh, floral wire or string, jute string, to attach the materials to the garland or wreath, um, scissors to cut the wire, clippers to cut the plants. And you really want to think about this before you create the wreath, where you're going to hang it and how heavy it's going to be because these command strip hooks um, are available for some heavy items, um, but the, some of these can only take, you know, like the suction cup ones um, can only take uh, a very light wreath, lightweight wreath. So um, think about where you're gonna hang it and what kind of hook you have. If you have a hook like this that goes over the door, uh, that's great. And then I just, I avoid glue so that um, I can disassemble the wreath or the garland after it's after I'm done with it. And um, so then I can just throw the materials, everything in the compost or into the, the green bin. Um, so I just try not to, I don't, someone last, asked last time about using hot glue and I would just uh, avoid that and try to keep all the materials as natural as possible. I also don't mix um, non-native things in with, uh, with my native plant materials. So this is, this is the heavy gauge uh, floral wire that I was talking about. So if your wreath is light, this, these are homemade and I made about 12 of them. Um, it, it looks like jute or twine, but it's got it's got a heavy gauge wire inside of it. So if you're going to be using light plant materials, um, you can uh, 
you can really use this. But um, if it gets too heavy, it's going to turn into an oval. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the homemade grapevine. Sorry. The homemade grapevine that my neighbor um, makes. And then this is a store-bought um, form and available at craft stores. You don't have to go to a floral supply for that. And it's, um, excuse me. <laughs> it's, um, it's strong, it's heavy enough that you can use a very lightweight floral wire uh, to attach things to it. And I'm gonna show you, um, I'm gonna show you how you stick the foliage, kind of weave the foliage in and out of these. So um, if you want to be successful um, your first time, get a get a flat flat wreath form like this and, and uh, just see how heavy the, the plant materials that you have are. So then I um, create arrangements outside if you can, and then display them outside. Um, and I always just get rid of my, um, my extra clippings at the end. And uh, I keep all the, all the items of the same kind. I usually have, I think in another photo I'll show, I, I usually keep all my foliage um, on a chair around the table. So this is showing um, how I make a garland. Um, and basically you just lie out the branches for as long as you want the garland. And in this case, I laid the, um, the coast redwood branches on the bottom. And then I haven't started wiring or anything. I'm just laying them all down and um, and then I add some other, um, the coast live oak, and then the um, the coyote brush. And so then once I have the garland, the length that I want it to be, then I would start using the, um, the, the wire and going through and just gathering it into a bunch, gathering it into a bunch and going along and kind of like sewing it together, uh, looping it around and um, uh, looping the wire and sticking the bobbin, the wire bobbin underneath to make a slip stitch. And then, so you can create a garland first and then put it into the wreath form on top of the wreath form. Here's a sugar bush garland, and I'm just gonna wire it around that wire, but that's not a good idea because I, I already know that the sugar bush garland is too heavy to keep that, that round form. It's gonna become an oval. So now I'm, I'm taking that garland and putting it over here on the wreath form, the metal wreath form from the store. So the other way of doing it is um, just making the wreath directly onto the wreath form. And um, uh, you weave, you again, you use your foliage, your the foliage that you have the most of, your base foliage on the bottom. And Coast Redwood, I love the fragrance of it. I like the look of it. I like it, how it dries. Um, and it also is very pliable. So it's gonna bend in and out of these uh, spots on the form. And um, this is an example above here is bay laurel. Um, and you see how you just stick it into the, the spots and you just kind of like weave the twig in and out around the vines. And it's okay to mix dried and fresh materials I definitely, um, these are, this is sage. Um, pro, oh, I know it's um, the creeping sage, bees bliss uh, sage, because I have a lot of that. 
And so it's already dried. It's already um, it's already dried up. So I'm working with my fresh materials first, and then I'm going to put the dried materials on top because they're more brittle and fragile. Whereas these guys, the fresh, the fresher ones are more pliable. So I mostly, I create all my layers first and then I wire it on. I go in and out, just kind of looping around and not too close, kind of loose. And then um, I can um, uh, twist the wire and use it to attach the pieces on top, like a little, uh, a few seed pods or some cones or some berries. And um, I can use that wire uh, that I've already applied to it um, and just pull it a little tighter. And so I don't have to use a lot of wire. And so I brought um, some, I brought some things to show you. And um, I can also, um, I can also take questions now, Mike, if you want me to do that first. Uh, sure. Um, now, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, really, the, the first questions are uh, actually from Cynthia. Um, she was asking about the coyote brush in your vase, uh, whether it was male or female. And uh, she said she's got one of each, but doesn't know which one is which. So, um, yeah, do you, I don't, I don't know. Um, do you, do you happen to know how to tell one way or the other or? I don't, I, I believe the I female is fluffier, but I don't know. Yeah. We can okay. just look it up. I was just, uh, I, I've had coyote brush in my gardens for a long time and I'm, I'm never quite sure which is which, but uh, Cynthia, I did want to ask you and uh, feel free to say no. But would it be possible to put your to have your slides? Because as I look at these things, I'm thinking, God, I want to create that one. But you know, it might be easier if I was just looking at a picture than you know, stop the video. Um, I I, uh, I can send them to you. Another thing you can do, given that um, for for anybody, uh, that uh, we're going to be putting the video up on uh, YouTube. You can go through and take screenshots as you go when you see one you'd like to repeat, like the copies. That's yeah, another. that's, that's yeah, an option that, anybody that's, can do. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I mean, and, uh, these, these, uh, these arrangements are just stunning. I, I think you actually talked a moment for very briefly that you had some Matilla poppy in one of your wreaths. Was that, is that true? Because mm -hmm, I have yes. a lot of Matilla poppy. The seed pods. It's still green. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I would, I think that's going to be my go-to plant for my wreaths. So, um, uh, so the, the stalks are very brittle on them uh, once they're dried. So you're going to, you're going to want to do them on the top layer on top of the fresher foliage. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. That's true for little sticks with moss on it too. Um, some things get quite brittle when they're dried. Um, Annalisa is asking if you could share a few more tips about how to wire the materials together sure. so you don't see the wire. Um, okay. So um, this is the form and I'm working with it flat on the table and I put all my layers on and then I pick it up a little bit and I use this kind of like a bobbin. I kind of go over and under and over and under and, um, and kind of do it loosely and not, not too often. This, this form has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So um, so I would probably use 
use this as an example, um, I would probably do it go in and out about eight times. And so that's with your bottom layers and attaches your bottom layers to it. And then you can tuck your, um, Cynthia, would you hold that that thing up again? What that the thing you said you use like a bobbin? Oh yeah, sure. I can I can show it to you a little bit better. So it's a uh, it's floral wire, and uh -huh. it's just it's available at craft stores. And this is a very light gauge. Um, I have a little bit heavier gauge as well. So um, it's it's very strong, very sturdy. So you can get the really thin stuff. You don't have to use, um, if you're trying to, you know, you can also use jute, um, which is a little bit more natural, I think. Um, so you don't have to use wire at all, but um, you can use a really thin wire, especially if you have a, a heavy uh, frame, especially if you're working with a heavy frame. So, um, I have some Western red cedar here, which is, uh, very, uh, very common. Um, this is what the, the wreaths are made out of, you know, that you can get at Costco and, um, Trader Joe's and they, um, you can buy garland and create your own wreath from that garland or you can trim your own cedar off your own trees, which is what I did today. So when it's fresh, it's very, very pliable. I just, you know, put it, curve it around. It's very, very pliable. And it's gonna dry very, um, very non-pliable. It's gonna, you know, it's gonna break. Well, once it's, once it's dry, you don't wanna be working with it. But when it's fresh, it's really easy to work with. So I would just um, attach some wire here and then go in and out a little bit around. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh... So, so you do see the wire, but, uh, but you use really fine wire and then you're gonna tuck things into the wire you're going to use the wire and you're going to you're going to uh, be tucking other materials on top so you can cover up the wire that way too i like the jute is you get that what at like michael's or something or what do you yep. think yeah you can get that there yep and so it's a little um i like it a lot because <clears throat> it's a little thicker so you do see it but it's very natural looking Right. Almost looks like green twine. Yeah. And then um, you can, you don't have to make your grape, grape, grape vines. I'm just lucky enough to have a friend who does them. But um, these are the grape vines available in, and they're available in a whole bunch of different sizes. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can so, use that as the base for your, uh, for your natural wreath. That, yeah. wreath. Yeah. And so you can you can take your green foliage and attach that around too. And for the the grapevines, you can like tuck it in. You don't need uh you don't even need wire because you can tuck it in to um underneath the vine. And to make those uh with the the vines. You just kind of loop it around, loop, 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 and then you do kind of a a couple like tie something around each one, kind of. Does it look like you had obviously the big loop of them, and then you had uh, um, look like yeah, right. You can see that, or or maybe they just uh, kind of did one of these around it. I see. You can just um. You can just tuck it in um, when when you're using pliable materials like this. Um, 
you can tuck it in and out. So I wove it kind of in and out. That's cool. Excellent. So, so yeah. You could you could buy a ready-made wreath that's not this is like fake ferns. So um you can buy the Western red cedar wreath from Trader Joe's in the size that you like, and then um, build on top of it, layer layer your your berries or your seed pods on top of it. Cool. Um, I know you use the sage a lot. Um, I do. And uh, so do you literally just uh, at the end of the season go and cut them all off and kind of have them sitting in there ready? Or do you need to do it where you cut them and then use them because otherwise you're not supple enough? That's a great question. These I um, I took, I cut tonight uh, just before. And um, so if I'm doing, if I'm doing um, a wreath with these, they are, they're just on the, this one is kind of curved already. So, but some of them are straight and some of them are a little bit more curved, but when they're fresh, you can bend them around like redwood and Western red cedar. But when they're dried like this, this is just a bouquet. This was just uh, a couple of weeks ago that I, I made into a bouquet. So uh, for the seed pods, so I'll take off the seed pod from them, but look at the leaves, they're all dried up. And you also have to, you also have to enjoy the the fragrance of salvia. If you think it smells like cat pee, you don't want to you don't want to be working with it. So um, I think it's a, an acquired fragrance, but um, but I love it. And um, and when it's fresh like this, even though it's at the end of the season, um, it's um it's probably still fresh and supple enough to 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 use in a wreath. Have you ever reused uh, material from one wreath to the next? I mean, kind of took part the some of the stuff that's still kind of maybe looks uh, like it's doing okay and use it again with new material. I do that with um with bouquets, but I don't really do it with wreaths. What I do is I just. I leave it hanging there for a month or two. And, you know, for the, the ones that dry nicely, you could, my, my friends that had the, um, the dried, um, the dried sage um, <clears throat> on, you know, it was just a little bit of, of a grapevine, a really thin grapevine. And, um, and they just, they kept it up there. I think it's still up there, you know, from a couple of years ago. So, um, so I don't really reuse because most most of the things decompose at some point. Right. Um, so, um, so this is Mike, Mike, let me talk for a minute. This is the other Cynthia. So we only have a few more minutes, like six more minutes, because we always end on time. Um, so this um, we haven't actually got any questions from the uh, attendees. Uh, so this is your this is your moment to. Um, you know, jump in with your question or a comment uh, and, and kind of uh, let's bring up something new. Does anyone have something to share? I did have another huh? question. I have another question. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, so you uh, talked about uh, manzanita, which I love manzanita. You <laughs> said not to use the flowers because they fall off. Um, and uh, you talked about madrone berries. Manzanita also has berries. Um, and uh, I was thinking that, you know, we were talking about the the toyon berries, which are only good for about a week, I think you said. But I would think that the manzanita berries might be able to last longer than that. Well, well, they'll dry too. The manzanita, um, uh, my tips for working with manzanita is just to use the, um, the, 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 old, uh, the old growth not um not cut off where it's going to have be flowering soon um in november in the santa cruz mountains the berries are are mostly done and and the, the flowers are already starting so um uh but you can you can make any of these 
any time of year. So when you could use manzanita berries or or um, red flowering currant berries, you know, any any of those berries that you have a lot of and and uh, you know that the birds don't need all of them. Um, you were... Um, I, Mike, can I say something, please? So Annalisa actually asked what I think is the same question, um, but she asked if you have any tips for working with manzanita. You did already talk about that, but there, is there anything more you want to share? Uh, no, I, I, that's great. If you have, uh, if you have manzanita or, um, um, uh, buckwheats or, you know, any of the things that I don't, uh, well, we have a lot of manzanita, but I didn't use it a lot in wreaths, but, um, uh, so there are some materials like these, um, these ferns, I only picked a couple of days ago. They're already, uh, they're already dried um but they're still pliable so um uh these big leaf maples um they're not gonna they're not gonna dry very nice i guess i could uh they're gonna they're gonna crumble and and um but manzanita manzanita is a really great one to use just if it's already started blooming just know that the flowers it it would seem to be very beautiful to have a wreath of of blooms, but the flowers will just drop off. So so I wouldn't even pick them. I would leave them to flower and create berries next year. Can, can I ask about acorns, Cynthia? Yeah, acorns are um, great. So um, I know you're concerned about uh, the um, tan oak, but um, do you work a lot with uh, Coast live oak, interior live oak, uh, valley oak, things like that, along with the whole, um, acorns. I would think that that would look really cool. Yeah, yeah, it would. It would. Um, I haven't had. I, I we haven't had a lot of mast years where there's a lot of acorns hanging around, so I haven't put them into uh, to wreaths. But um, I, I think this year is a good year for acorns. I heard. Cool and. So, um, one last... if Mike, you know, it's, it's Mike. It's, it's uh, really time that we should um, kind of wind up now. So I just want to uh, thank Cynthia so much for another great presentation. Um, with these, your creations are absolutely gorgeous. I'm sure the audience all agrees with this. And I will be putting this, uh, putting up your video very soon. Uh, certainly within a, a week or so so that people can uh, use it to get going on their holiday decorations. All right, so if people want to type in something and to give it, Cynthia a message, she will be given the chat. So if you have something specifically you want to say, just type it into the chat. Um, All right, so I'm going to turn off the recording now. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Mike and Cynthia. Um, do you ever work with the little test tube things where you have like a little thing that allows you to put some water in there?